uh, so I, I started writing books about 20 years ago. My first book was um, an autobiography, which is this one. And I had an agent, and she got it published, and blah, blah, blah. And it's, it is quite an interesting book, I know, because, you know, what happened to me. Um, but <coughs> what happened was that my son now lives in Madrid, and he'd moved to Spain about 14 years ago, something like that. And um, I'm because of what I was doing writing books, I wasn't making any money because of the types of books I, I write. I wasn't making any money out of it. I was spending less and less time making money out of mergers and acquisitions. So I was delving deep, deeper and deeper into my assets, my savings, and all this sort of thing. Um, so uh, six years ago, or seven years ago, um, I'm, uh, by now I'm living in Bristol. I've still got a home. I've got a home in Bristol, a home in London. Um, and obviously I have to sell a home in London to survive. Um, then I get to the point when I can't afford to keep the, the home in Bristol. So I said to my very best friend, um, what do I do? You know, I'm, I'm down to this X amount of money. And he said, well, if I were you, because I was single and I was happily being on my own, he said, I would buy a motorhome and tour Europe. Well, at this time, I was writing, a, I'd started to write a book um, that um, meant that if I went to Europe, I could actually do quite a lot of research on this book, and I'd live in this motorhome, and as I already had a, a camper van, which is a much smaller version of a motorhome, I thought, well, this is, could be quite a nice life, you know. And uh, at the time, so at the time I was about 71 or something or other. So I do research in the north, uh, if you think of the coast of... of, um, of, of uh, the, the French coast um, between Saint Malo and Biarritz, Bordeaux, Biarritz, and then all the northern coast of Spain and the whole of the coast of Portugal. Because uh, you may or may not be aware, but what's happened in Portugal with regards to drugs and um, recovery from drug addiction and the laws they decriminalized all drugs in 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 Portugal, and it was all done when. Um, uh, uh, um, his name, the, the, the United Nations General Secretary was the Prime Minister of Portugal and he, he put this through and um, uh, yes and anyway um, so I'm doing this research in, in France, Spain, Portugal and, and I end up on the south coast uh, Andalusia of Spain going back and forth between Malaga and Sevilla um, back and forth, back and forth and all the time I keep seeing these signs Tickets to Tangier. Tickets to Tangier. If any of you know this road, they're everywhere. You can't miss them. It's just um, so they all go from either Algeciras, boats to Algeciras, from Algeciras to Tangier, or from Tarifa to to Algeciras. So um, after I'd seen these signs 10, 20 times, I thought, well, I'll nip over there for the weekend. So I leave my motor home somewhere in. Tarifa, get on the ferry, go over there, and I stay in a very nice boutique hotel. But I'd made inquiries before I went there um, to make sure that the owner of the boutique hotel spoke English so I could ask him some questions about drugs and addiction in Morocco, because I knew they were the biggest growers of hashish in the world. I don't know if you know that, but they are by far, and that's an official UN figure. That the estimate is they grow half of it, but I, th I think that's an exaggeration. But anyway, so I go there, and I realize very quickly that they have the worst drug problem. I mean, I've been, by this time, I've been to organizations in over 30 countries in Europe, in America, North America, and Asia, um, with huge drug problems. But they're doing something about it. You know, they have organizations where they're actually doing some of the right things about it. In Morocco, I discovered very quickly they weren't doing anything. And then I see something I've never seen in my life before. I'm sitting at the... At, has anybody ever been to Tangier? Okay. So I'm sitting at the Riff Cinema, which is in Grand Soccer, which is the main square in Tangier. And I'm, I'm there back and forth because I'm staying quite nearby in my, my boutique hotel. And around the corner from where I'm sitting, in an open-air cafe, come these little children, and there were about eight of them, and they were aged between eight and 11 years of age. 
and they were all sniffing from a bag. Now, I didn't know what they were doing, but they were sniffing solvent, which is addictive, and these were all drug addicts, every one of them. I'd, I'd, I'd go back to my hotel, and um, I ask a few questions, and I discover that um, there are an estimated 70,000 street children living in Morocco, and over 10,000 of them are drug-addicted street children between the age of 8 and 14 years of age. Now, if you've never seen anything like it, I can assure you, it, it just went straight to my heart. I mean, I've, I'm used to seeing drug addicts, alcoholics, and so on. That's what I do. I help drug addicts and alcoholics. It's, it's part of my life today. But I've never seen anything like this. Little kids stoned out of their minds at you know, 8, 9, or 10 o'clock in the morning. You know, this, this sort of thing is unbelievable. It's, so anyway, I, 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 I realized that um, I've got to do some, try to do something about it. So I go back to my hotel and I see the head porter or whatever, concierge, and I say, I need to see a doctor. I want to talk to him. Can you find me an English speaking doctor? So he does. I go to see him and I tell him, you know, what I do, that I try to help drug addicts and alcoholics. And I said, I'd like to come back. Um, to Tangier and see if I can help in any way and um, he said yep I can help you uh, and then I said well if I come back here I'm going to need somewhere to live and he said I can help you with that as well he said my brother-in-law owns properties um, uh, 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 <laughs> property. he owns a huge property in Tangier if, if you know it quite well in, in the new mountain so where the, where the palace, the king's palace is, and, and so on. So it's a very plush part of, of Tangier. So he says he's got an apartment there, which is, which is beautiful, and you know you could rent it from him and at a very good price. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm having to cut corners financially now. So in the hotel, I discover, I'm, I'm chatting to a woman two or three times. Oh yeah, there's something else that happened. You know. um, so this woman, I meet her after breakfast one day, and she invites me to go on a tour with the other people in the hotel with the gu with a guide um, of t to Tangier. Now there are two very famous cafes in Tangier, all where, where they use a lot of smoke a lot of cannabis. One of them is called Cafe Baba, the other one is called um, Cafe Hafa. And Cafe Baba is in the centre of Tangier in, in the Medina. And um, so we go in there, and I, I've joined this tour reluctantly because I, I don't like that sort of thing, but I, you know, I'm a bit of a loner. Anyway, I joined the tour, and we walk in there, and as soon as you walk in, the perfume, the aroma of cannabis just wafted over. And I used to love smoking cannabis. I mean, it was, to me, it was just bliss. You know, I had wonderful highs from it. Um, but anyway, there we are. <laughs> That's a long time ago. So we walk in there. And there's probably 30 young people sitting around on tables smoking cannabis. And um, there are four, there are three girls and a boy on one table. And they saw, there was something about them. And so I'm with my little party of five or six people. Uh, can, uh, they were Mexicans actually, and, and, and a British and Moroccan. Uh, yes, the Moroccan guy. So I walk over to these, these young people and um, I start talking. Well, because of, you know, and, and a lot of these very bright kids in Morocco, they speak English. Um, but then you've got all the illiteracy as well, so it's, it's not all like that. Anyway, they spoke quite, quite good English, and they're all smoking, you know, uh, cannabis. And um, so I, I talk a bit of uh, drug lingo to them, so they were on the right wavelength. And they realize very quickly that I'm, I'm not dangerous, I'm not the law or anything like that. And I said, I'm just interested in in what's happening on the drug scene in, in Morocco. And they were very helpful. Um, and after we'd been talking for five minutes or so, I said, look, would you mind if I stay and talk to you? And so they, they said, we'd be delighted to. So then my, my friend and the guide come over and they say, um, are we going? Um, <laughs> are you coming with us? And I said, no, I'm staying here. I'm, uh, I'm, I need to talk to these people. So I did, and then I met the the owner of the cafe, and I found out the history of it, and you know people like Bob Marley, the Rolling Stones, and 
many, many very famous people that I, I won't mention um, had been smoking dope there and, and all the rest of it. Um, so I did my research, I, I, and um, and then so uh, so um, yeah. So I, the doctor says you can go and stay at my my doctor brother-in-law's place probably. So I go and see that it's a fabulous apartment. I mean, just pure luxury. And I said I'll take it. Um, so that was in I went there twice in in October and December. 2016 and I went back to live there on about the 7th or 8th of January um, 2017 and from that time on most of the time I the next six months I started um, uh, I stayed most of the time in in Tangier helping um, drug addicts and their families I I put over oh, up over 50 posters in pharmacies so I had all these people coming to meet me um, and all the rest of it, and, and it was wonderful. And some of them, you know, were, were, I was definitely helping. But at the same time, I realized from contacts that I had that it would be very wise for me to be going to Casablanca um, because there were, was a little bit more help being, because there was no help being given in Tangier. There was a tiny bit in Casablanca. And my favorite film of all time by far was Casablanca. I mean, for me, I, I mean, I watch it every year, and that's nothing to do with what I've been doing in Morocco. I just love the film. It's just, just incredible how, how one man can have so much courage, or two men can have so much courage. Uh, I just never understood it, but there we are. <coughs> I know that's fiction, but I, I think people like that are out there. So um, I'm getting on pretty well with, uh, with what I'm doing in Tangier, and then I start to go to uh, Casablanca every week by train. And if anybody's ever been, this is, don't forget, this is six years ago, by train from Casablanca, Tangier to Casablanca, it's the most wonderful experience. You just go through rural land, see all the farmers and the markets on the side, just incredible, all mules and donkeys, and just incredible. I, I absolutely loved it. I used to sit at the window, just amazed. But what was always incredible was I kept meeting all people on the trains that helped me. Because many times I thought, I can't do this. It was too painful. It was too difficult doing it by myself. Um, and then when I went, got to, to Casablanca, I started to meet people who were helping me somewhat. And one of them said to me, we've got a mother who's got a son, and this son is in a terrible state. Could you help him? So I met the, the mother and her, and her daughter, and the son had started to attack the mother, he was 18 years of age, and he started attacking.